Um, thanks. Um, and then we are going to have a, an introduction to the template from Gjalt Jorn and Olmo, who are representing the team that developed this template. Um, so I will turn it over to um, Gjalt Jorn to introduce himself, and then Olmo, Mark, and, and myself. We'll just go around real quick. Okay, I'm uh, Gjalt Jorn Peters, or everybody mostly calls me GJ. It's great that you make the effort to try to pronounce my name, but most people can't, even in the Netherlands. So most people stick to GJ. Um, and I'm an uh, associate professor of um, methodology and statistics, or MNT, as we say in Dutch, uh, at the Open University of the Netherlands in the psychology faculty. Um, and I've my, my or original field was behavior change, where we work quite post positivistically, basically using whichever method we need to solve real world problems. Um, and partly because of this, I've done a lot of systematic reviews. Um, and of course, as uh, pre-registration becomes more common, I've been wanting to pre-register those. And that didn't always work out for our projects. So that's kind of where this started and why I'm involved. That's great. Thank you, Olmo. Yeah, my name is uh, Olmo van den Acker, and I'm just finishing up my PhD uh, at the Meta Research Center at Tilburg University. Yeah, that's in the Netherlands as well. And um, my PhD is about pre-registration. So uh, that's well, nicely linked to what we're discussing today. And I'm basically assessing effectiveness of pre-registration in psychology uh, or the social sciences. Uh, so that's my main topic. And I just finished, or well, I just started a new job actually as well uh, uh, at the Quest Center in Berlin. So it's my third, third day. So I'm now on a work retreat actually. So uh, yeah, exciting times. That's awesome. That's congratulations. I didn't realize that. That's wonderful. Um, all right. Good deal. Um, do we have Mark as well from COS? Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm here. I am the real Mark. Uh, I don't know about some of you guys, but Zoom's giving us attitude this morning and it's made you guys some of me. So apparently we're going to take over the world. Anyways, hi, I <laughs> am Mark Call. I am the product owner for OSF Registries and work here for the Center for Open Science. All right, awesome. And I am uh, Katie Corker from Grand Valley State University in Michigan. Uh, I'm associate professor of psychology, and I'm also doing some work with COS on involving community engagement. Um, and I also happen to be involved as a contributor on this template. So I certainly did not do as heavy a lift as, as the project leaders here that are presenting, um, but I helped a little bit. So it's exciting to see uh, the template moving forward uh, and getting integrated into OSF, and uh, we're excited to uh, to introduce it to you today. Um, so I will just, in case we had a couple more people join, I'll just say um, the agenda will be in the chat for you. There's a place to submit questions during the presentation so that we can sort of uh, gather those up um, for the Q&A portion later. And uh, if you'd like, you can also sign in on the agenda so that we can um, you know, see everyone that attended. And you can also see and learn a little bit about the others who are on the call um, so that we can all get to know each other a little bit better. All right, so I will turn it over to uh, y'all, GJ, I'll go with that, and, and Olmo uh, to introduce the template. Excellent. Well, basically kind of the... Um doing it together a little bit. Already when we prepared, Olmo reminded me of some things that could be worthwhile telling. So basically he'll just butt in. I'll start a bit with where it started and then um, we'll move on a bit. Let's see. Excellent. So this is a um, big group of people that was involved in creating it. Um, apart from KJ, I also saw uh, Amy briefly. So hi and Rickard. Um, and there are loads more people that you can um, see on this list that I'm not all going to name because you probably read them by now. So this project started um, out of, well, frustration is a big word, but basically I was working with a PhD student who did a systematic review about um, sports because they can, uh, oh, sorry, a bachelor thesis student because they can kind of choose their own topics. And it was about um, red cards and yellow cards. It wasn't a multi-analyst uh, multi project. It was just a systematic review. Um, and he couldn't pre-register it anywhere. So then I started looking for ways that this was possible to pre-register it outside of Prospero somewhere because they only take uh, health-related research and they don't take scoping reviews either. Um, 
And as you can see, it didn't get too much interaction because I'm not very popular. But fortunately, this was retweeted by somebody who was considerably more popular. Um, and then there were some responses and some uh, links where I also met um, Nikki, who you see at the bottom here. So quite early, you um, see that we were discussing doing this at Open Science Framework because, of course, the Open Science Framework had a number of these templates. And this would be you know, great to add because then everybody can just uh, pre-register systematic reviews there. So we were thinking about maybe um, starting one, but that, that specific account of the Open Science Framework back then, this was like uh, four years ago, wasn't super hyperactive. So we didn't really get so much response. Uh, but at some point, uh, Nikki had the, um, for some reason, uh, drew Ryan's attention. And then he got us in touch with Matthew Spitzer, if I pronounced that correctly, from the Center for Open Science. And then we basically um, started thinking about it. How can we do this? And that's kind of how we got the ball rolling. Um, Nikki was a veterinarian who also had problems posting on Prospero. And that already opened up the, because I always think from psychology, you know, it's like, Apparently, there are also other sciences, but from my perspective, it's just psychology. So we have qualitative, we have quantitative research, we have systematic reviews, but that's kind of it. Apparently, it turns, it turns out there's a whole world out there with people working radically differently. Um, and that's kind of one of the things we try to do here, to make something that everybody can use. So we got together this team, partly also through Twitter and through uh, people we knew. We didn't do some like general call through societies. But we, um, yeah, use more of a snowball approach, um, and then we started working on the uh, form based on earlier uh, forms that existed, like for example the Prisma guidelines. Um, in within the team already, there were some um, uh, differences on, on opinion, which is good, of course, if you want to make something general and inclusive. On, for example, the role of pre-registration. Um, Olmo, you alluded to this earlier. Do you remember specifically what we discussed? I mean, I know some. I know at least one point where I differ with at least Daniel Larkins and some other people as to the role of uh, pre-registration. Uh, yeah. So uh, some some people were wondering, hey, why do you need to uh, pre-register a systematic review? Uh, because you're not collecting primary data. Um, and so at least my my point of view is that whenever you uh, are going to draw a statistical inference or maybe even a scientific general instance, then it's good to pre-register your design, what you're going to do. And also like systematic reviews, they can be systematic and objective, but they still um, have room for researcher biases and uh, in all kinds of selections, for example, in the selections of studies, especially if you're already familiar with the literature. Uh, and to, let's say, prevent these biases, uh, I think pre-registration has a, has a big role to play uh, because you're logging everything beforehand before all these decisions are made. So that, that was my uh, main reason for, uh, for going into this project. Yeah. And as somebody who does a PhD in pre-registration, you're probably one of the most knowledgeable people on the whole topic in this group. Um, yeah. So. Basically, we started integrating these items, looking at also our own experience and what we did. We had, for example, also some librarians like Amy, for example. Um, so we did have these different expertises and like we have researcher perspectives, a librarian perspective, et cetera. Um, and then through some rounds and discussions, we worked on the form and tried to streamline it a bit to have the same types of items within every section and stuff like that. Um, and then in the end, the form resulted. Um, as a kind of context, it might be good to emphasize the kind of, um, yeah, the vision or the aims of the um, of the form. So the idea was to not make it specific to any discipline. So ideally, even people who do a systematic review of case law, for example, in some country or multiple countries, could use this. Um, that's of course a bit harder because then you have to realize that not all the the sources that people extract information from are always articles. So that could be more general, also reports or other things. And also, ideally, it wasn't specific to any review type. Um, I assume everybody here has, has looked at the form. At the end, you see there are quite some fields that are kind of specific to um, meta-analyses, like to quantitative uh, synthesis. But we did try to formulate everything such that it could also apply to, for example, qualitative uh, synthesis as much as possible. The consequence of this was also that there were no obligatory items. 
because there's always you can always think of some type of review where something wouldn't necessarily make sense. So instead of that, the approach was much more to uh, list some items that we consider extra relevant. They uh, achieved a little gold. They got a little. They achieved a little gold star by their great performance. These items got a gold star, um, but they wouldn't actually be obligatory. Um, so that's, I think, kind of a brief introduction as to the context and the um, well, the vision aims. Omo, is there any other important stuff? Yeah, maybe we can uh, shortly mention the force we use for for drafting the item. So, um, if I recall correctly, we used uh, the Prisma statement uh, as as a source um, at the Society for the Improvement of Psychological Science policy. We also uh, came together in in a, in a conference, I think it's called, uh, to draft uh, a, a template for meta analysis uh, specifically. Um, and there's also uh, some people in the group who uh, drafted a registration form for uh, systematic reviews in animal research. And it's also a kind of a different perspective. And there's a uh, market and, uh, and quite a big group that designed the template specifically for non interventional research, uh, systematic reviews in that uh, area. So uh, we basically gathered items for all these small these sources. We bundle them together and we saw, hey, what are the overlaps? Uh, what are the things we need to add? Um, and this, through like a sequential process, we arrived eventually at this uh, this template that we're going to discuss. Perfect. Katie, was that kind of what you had in mind, or would you yeah, like more words? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I think. Um... One of the things I'm reminded of, yeah, is how uh, how many different perspectives we brought to the table already in developing the form, and you know we're continuing to solicit that input from people from all different kinds of backgrounds. At at this point, I think one of the things that we're really eager to do as we deploy the template more broadly in OSF is to make sure that it's in a good position for people from all different kinds of fields and backgrounds. Um, so that's where. Uh, the community feedback will will be so important to make sure that we get at least a good version 1.0 up <laughs> and then uh, it can be iterated later as necessary but hopefully we can get a, um, a very solid version up for our, for the first draft um, so it is the form itself is linked in the agenda and I think our next um, plan is to actually go through the form itself and give a little bit of an intro overview to it and then, uh, and then we'll move on to the time for Q and A. Um, and I am monitoring the questions so far. So far, no questions. But um, please do feel free to to drop those in as we're as we're talking, so that we have um, something to start from when we discuss in a little bit. So I'll turn it back to you. Oh, sorry. I thought um, Mark was going to do this bit, but we can do it too. Would that, uh... I think. Yeah, we. Well, I misremembered who was going to do it. So I, if you're oh. all right, that would be okay if we walk yep. through the Adobe part of it, if that's yep. all right. Sure. Thank you. And I went ahead and put in the link in the chat. So anyone yeah. can look at it on their own screen, but also join if you want to share and welcome through it. Yeah. Oh, awesome as well. <laughs> I think I might need to allow some more. One second. <laughs> Exciting. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um. So just to prelude the conversation for everyone, these are mock-ups to kind of show exactly how they will reflect what it will look like within the OSF registration system. Um, when you go through them, everything on the left-hand side and the next button and the back buttons will be clickable. Everything else is not. It's just enough to be able to provide context about the content of the questions, how we can improve them, revise them, et cetera. Yes. So it starts with the metadata that's pretty similar to most um, pre-registration forms. So it has a title and it has a description to give some, well, <laughs> metadata about this specific registration. Um, you can add a license, you can add subjects. I think these will be familiar to pretty much everybody. The landing page has an explanation about the form. One of these uh, things um, here is that it links to more specialized forms because because it is such a general purpose inclusive form if you do a meta-analysis using a dedicated meta-analysis form 
might be have, have more benefits. As Olmo indicated, it can help uh, prevent biases by alerting you to specific things that you have to take into account for a meta-analysis that are quite niche in the broader landscape of reviews and therefore are not in the general inclusive form. Um, and it allows you to document more uh, accurately. So ironically, even though this is a pretty big form and you know we worked hard on it, we think it works very well. The idea is that ideally, if there's a more specialized one, it can be beneficial to use that instead. So they, they, these are the, um, well, the instructions to use. And then we get to the actual form. If I'm going too fast, by the way, please just let me know because I've had a whole day and I'm pretty well caffeinated by now. So. Um, one of the things you'll notice here is that type of review, review stages, current review stage are all just open text fields. And we had quite a lot of discussions about this actually in the team. Um, there's a lot of benefits to using categories, to using closed questions, because then you the answers become machine readable. So it's easy to create overviews of the forms and you make them more searchable. But on the other hand, that requires an exhaustive and mutually exclusive set of categories to exist. And we couldn't actually find any that we were really sure, for example, even types of review that didn't differ per discipline or per field. So that's why actually all the fields are just open text. Fields. So you start off with specifying the type of review in whichever words are common in your discipline. Then you list the stages that you distinguish within your review and the stage that you're in at the moment. Then the, the envisioned start date and end date, because in my experience, at least, those are um, rough guidelines generally. Um, then more background information, primary research questions, and potentially secondary research questions, where the idea is that your primary research questions are mostly what shape the design, and the secondary research questions are things that you can also answer, but that have less influence on your decisions. Then if you have any hypotheses or expectations, if you don't do confirmatory research, for example, uh, you can list them here. And then you describe the variables that you aim to um, extract from the studies. So the main variables will generally be outcomes, for example, or predictors, um, or sorry, um, dependent variables. And then you will have independent variables like interventions that you're looking at for treatments. If you look at RCTs, for example. Then you can list some additional variables. And then you describe the software that you will use for the review. That's one of the goals here is to make sure that you remember citing those also in the end. And so that it's easy, clear to people if they want to um, use resources from your review, whether they can, depending on whether they have required licenses, for example, or if they don't have licenses, whether they are familiar with the software. Then funding, conflicts of interest, and overlapping authorships. That's one that was new for me when we started this. Um, sometimes you do a review because you are quite involved in the field, and then you might end up in a somewhat awkward situation that like one third of the studies was co-authored by you. And then it's good to have a plan for how you deal with this situation. So you can describe that here. Then we go back up to the search strategy. Fortunately, on the Open Science Framework, you can save your drafts halfway. This one has only been saved 11 days ago, as you can see here. But <laughs> of course, in real life, we'll save them more uh, frequently. Um, then you list the databases you search. I assume that everybody here is pretty much familiar with how systematic reviews work. So you probably know the difference between databases and interfaces. Um, if not, the interfaces are the, the servers, the website you usually use to access the database after, uh, behind them. Um, whether you cover any gray literature, the inclusion and exclusion criteria that you aim to uh, use, and then the query strings that you will enter into the database through the interfaces. Then the procedure you will use to validate the search. Ideally, Usually, you'll already have some target articles that you know you will want to include. So you can, for example, use these to check against the uh, hits from your uh, queries. Then any additional search strategies you use in addition to just searching databases. How you plan to contact authors, what you do when you contacted authors, whether you are planning to report on this or not, and if so, what you will report. How um, yeah, long-lived you think your search will be, how long do you think it will be valid. That, of course, if there's, imagine that there's like a, a pandemic that starts, then the expiration date might be a bit um, shorter than if it's a topic that's relatively stable, like I imagine something in history or archaeology. Um, then you can justify your search strategy, and then you can add any additional miscellaneous, miscellaneous details. These last two are in every section from now on, so that you can always justify why you made the choices the way you make that, made them. 
um, and provide any additional details. Then we move on to the screening. You can describe the stages that you use for the screening. Sometimes you do everything in one go. Sometimes you try to do something quick in the first round, and then you go more uh, comprehensively later on. Whether you uh, blind or mask uh, any of the fields. For example, you might not want the screeners to be influenced by the journal, because if it's a prestigious journal, they might be more inclined to include or whatever. The exclusion criteria you use during the screening, because of course you can really include, because there's not an inclusion criteria that can trump an exclusion criterion. So basically you just exclude during the screening. And the literal screener instructions, ideally. And there you can also upload a file, because often, of course, there are Word documents or PDFs with instructions about what exactly they should do. Then how you will look at the reliability of the screening. You usually use multiple screeners, and then you usually really start screening when you're happy with the reliability, which means the screener instructions are clear enough that people can work with them. Um, how you deal with incons or inconsistency with disagreements between screeners, when one person says that something should be included and the other person says that obviously it should be excluded. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, whether you include all the sources, sometimes you may only want to look at a number of the sources, like the articles, for example, that are included. And if that's the case, then how you will choose them and how you will determine your sample size. And finally, the procedure, how you justify the procedure for the screen. Also here, you can explain how you plan to manage the data and share the data. Because ideally, of course, if people weren't already planning to, this will prompt them to realize, ah, of course, I want to share all this openly. Um, and then they can explain that later. Then we finally have our hits, so we can start extracting. Then it starts with listing all the entities you want to extract, like author names or effect sizes or variable names or whatever else. And for like legal cases, for case law, it could be whether somebody was, um, what's the word? Well, whether they had to go to prison or whatever. Um, then the stages in which you will extract, that can also be similar to screening. You might, if you expect that you will get a lot of uh, sources that you want to extract from, you might want to try to do something efficiently at first and then do it more comprehensively later on. Again, the instructions for the extractors, that's probably even more important than the instructions for the screeners because those entities you extract determine your data and the quality of the data. So it's important that everybody agrees and ideally that others that are not in your team can also extract with similar results. Then any blinding slash masking of extractors. For example, you might want people, the people who extract, do not know what your research questions or hypotheses are. Again, how you look at the reliability. And again, how you um, reconcile if there is a disagreement between extractors. Then the justification for your, why you extract the way you want to extract. Again, how you share your uh, results. For example, the forms with extracted data and any additional details. And then we can finally start with the synthesis part. It starts with any data transformations you want to do. For example, for quantitative uh, research, you quite often will want to um, converse, convert all the effect sizes to one metric, for example, uh, Pearson correlations. Or for qualitative research, you might want to uh, standardize the kinds of results that you extract from uh, results from uh, articles like cluster them so that it's easier to synthesize them later on. How you deal with missing data when even after contacting others, stuff is just not there or can't be um, found anymore. How you validate the data you found, because after all, after you extract it, there might still be some errors, just like with empirical research. So ideally you have some procedure to look at this. How you look at the quality of studies, for example, risk of bias uh, assessment. And then finally, how you plan to synthesize if you do more confirmatory research, or if you have expectations and you are planning to draw certain conclusions about something, then it helps to clarify how you will come to these conclusions in, um, in an early stage. So you can explain that here. Again, you can mask or blind the person who does the synthesis, or you can have multiple synthesists, of course. Um, and then you can still mask or blind them. If you have multiple people who do the analysis, for example, in parallel, then you'll want to have some procedure of looking at reliability. And again, you may want to um, have a procedure for reconciling any differences between them. Unless you're doing like a many meta analysis study. If that hasn't been done yet, maybe we should start that afterwards. Um, 
how you look at publication bias, how you do sensitivity analysis, and finally, again, justification, data management, and the miscellaneous details. And then finally, oh, we can't look at the review, but everybody will recognize this probably. Um, at the end, you basically see your results. You can review before you um, finally submit it. So that's the form in its current state. And now, of course, we are very much looking forward to all the suggestions and questions to improve it into a better version. Thank you so much, TJ. That was really great. Um, I'm reminded, you know, just looking at the uh, level of detail and the length and so on, I think every supervisor who suggests that their PhD student do a systematic review for their, <laughs> for their research project should be forced to just review the form, first of all, to remember all of the different steps that go into it before, before beginning. Um, so we do have a couple of questions that have come through, um, and I will, oh, and more coming in. This is great. Um, I think I'll start with one um, about mandatory versus optional items. Um, so we have actually been discussing this recently about uh, sort of our, our philosophy or approach to whether or not, you know, all of these many items should be required. Um, so do one or both of you want to talk a little bit about our thoughts on that, and maybe we could also um, we could have some other input from from folks to react to what you're saying. Omar, shall I? Uh, you correct me if uh, I'm wrong. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, for OSF we decided on no uh, obligatory items, uh, basically because that was a technical issue. Uh, so maybe Mark can talk about that more. Well, I, th I think there was actually there needs to be at least some obligatory items because uh, they have to have things like the the metadata fields with uh, contributors and so on like those have to be there. But if we have no obligatory items at all, then it creates a situation where someone could register their review and have almost nothing in it, either completely empty or, or almost empty. So a concern is that if if all items are optional to make the form maximally flexible, then we worry um, about yeah incomplete entries. So I think actually what we had landed on last time was that maybe we would do the opposite, which was to make everything required. And then it forces the uh, user, the person completing the form to um, at least indicate not applicable or something in, in response to every question. Uh, so go ahead, GJ. Yeah, yeah exactly. What Olmos said was, was exactly what I also explained in the presentation. I, the plan was to have nothing obligatory. That's why we had the gold stars for the things that we thought were important, but not mandatory. Um, but yeah, it's right. It's correct that, of course, if you have a system for pre-registration, it's a bit lame if people are able to enter completely empty pre-registrations. And then making everything uh, obligatory kind of solves that. Because, of course, you can always say, this doesn't matter. And an added benef benefit is that you then have an explicit statement from the authors as a result of their reflection on that item. And that, I think, also helps. Um, well, maybe it's too optimistic to think it directly helps uh, to uh, prevent bias. But at least from a meta-scientific point of view, um, it helps you see what, how people consider these things and where they have a more comprehensive explanation or where they just say NA or whatever. Yeah, Does one where we, we also had with that was um, that it might be too burdensome to fill out the form. So uh, if every item is mandatory, so you can, of course you can say just NA, two letters, that's easy. Uh, but maybe that's something that the, the audience can also provide feedback on. So there were a lot of items, as you saw, and if they're also, they're all mandatory now. So uh, is that too much? Uh, or do you agree with our reasoning that uh, this way of going about it makes sense from a scientific standpoint? Yeah, that's perfect. So I would invite anyone who would like to speak up, please, please do so. Or you can uh, respond in the chat as well if we've got too many people to all talk at once. Um, very curious if anyone wants to speak on that. Uh, yeah, Alexandra. Oh, I think I just beat Matt there. <laughs> Um, so um, I'm speaking with my Prospero for um, animals hat on um, the issue that we have sometimes is that people, because um, our items, uh, most of them are mandatory. The issue that we have is that some review authors just copy paste the guidance. Um, so I think I posted in the, uh, in the in the Google forms if there was some way that OSF would support 
semi-automated data validation to just check that it's either not blank, NA, like none or whatever, um, because yeah, that um, is a manual process for us to check at Prospero for animals at the moment. Thank you. Yeah, that's super useful. Um, Matt, did you still want to chime in? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was my question. Um, yeah, I guess my concern is like someone someone could put a lot of effort into a pre-registration and then they can claim they pre-registered their study fairly and then someone else can put minimal effort and also make the same claim. So I, I sort of feel that there needs to be a few more mandatory items. Um, especially if it's not being peer reviewed. Yeah, so the way it's now is that everything's mandatory, right? Um, so that's in the concern that Olmo just voiced was um, that maybe people will just maybe, well, the concern was that it might, is too burdensome. Of course, that would translate the fear is that people just don't use it because it's too much work. Because it has like 65 items. So it's quite a lot. Um, the point is that as I said, it's, like, it's supposed to be inclusive, right? So you have a form that's created to be useful for people, regardless of whether they do a review of government reports about city planning or case law about regarding, I don't know, um, people breaking into houses or whatever those law people do, um, or just a normal topic in psychology, like, for example, uh, determinants of energy relevant behavior. Um, and ideally, it works, can work for all of them. So because of this, it's framed quite um, generally. But there are some items there, for example, data transformations that will just not apply maybe to case law, or it, it might apply, but in that field, people might not do it yet, you know, because these things change over time. And then, of course, not applicable would be an acceptable answer. Um, but they would be facing all these questions. So this is, I think, one of the yeah, harder issues to solve in the objective perfect yeah. way. Yeah, I agree. It's, it, it needs to be a balance. I, I mean, I had to use I used the OSF to pre-register something, and uh, yeah, not all of the fields were applicable. For, um, but I guess at least if you make them mandatory and then they can put NA, it sort of gives the impression that the defaults should be to try and you know put something in. <laughs> yeah. But Alexander, for example, but that might also be because Prospero does have more narrow use case. So you do have clear ideas about what should be there, which you can't have with a general form, because you suggested kind of the opposite, right? To uh, disallow people from saying this does not apply to me or NA or whatever. So there is a kind of tension. I mean, I would say that ideally, if people have a health related um, uh, systematic review, they would use Prospero <laughs> because that's more dedicated. Yeah, um, some really interesting tensions here then between sort of being inclusive, uh, uh, comprehensive rather, and uh, and being more narrow or more more user friendly potentially. Um, so if folks have thoughts on that, yeah, you can continue to add them to the chat or to put them in the feedback form. Um, Ricard. Yeah, I, I think that like at uh, at the journal we're working on we are looking at a lot of re re registrations and so on i mean you always need to look at how people use the pre-registrations anyway so i'm not too concerned about the fact that people might say that oh we pre-register these with this template and they just answer a bunch of nas because i mean you could also answer everything um elaborately and, and so on it might still be very very poorly worded and everything like that so uh, the pre-registration is only saying that it's a way to assess the transparency throughout the process. Uh, so uh, people are always going to try and game that. And I don't think we can avoid that by you know, forcing people to use it. Thank you, Evan. Sorry, Evan, you're muted. Thanks. Um, as I look at this, I'm thinking about the difference between what I think of as a registration and a protocol in this context and in other contexts. And one of the things that I think is great about uh, trial registries in medicine, where you know a lot of this kind of kicked off, is that they have structured data elements that are searchable and uh, ensure that 
you know, I can go into a database and find all of the trials that have been done about something I'm interested in. And that means that you have a minimum set of items that have to be entered in a certain way. The WHO has a, a minimum data set that trial registers around the world are, are working from. And there's a little bit of free text in things like clinicaltrials.gov, but there's not a whole lot of free text in, in those or they're you know, short and structured fields. And what I see here are larger text boxes that correspond to, in some cases, very major sections of a protocol. And so this, to me, looks less like what I would consider registration in some ways and more like what I would think of as a, uh, you know, a structured outline for a protocol. So uh, I think there, there's that tension. And if I were to design something for registration, I would probably strip it down and have structured elements rather than so much free text. And if I were developing a protocol, I might go in a different way uh, as well. So I see the guidance in the document here, and then uh, you know, I'm comparing it with Prisma 2020, and there's actually much more detail in Prisma 2020 for many of these items than there is in, in this document. So if I were thinking of this as a registration, I think it's a bit too much. And if I were thinking of this as a protocol, I actually think the guidance might not be sufficient to write a a Prisman compliant protocol or a protocol that uh, complies with other reporting guidelines. Yeah, that is great feedback. And it's definitely something we discussed among the team. Uh, do, do you want to react to that, either of you? Anybody? Yeah, I can react. I mean, basically, this is indeed one of the tensions. And it also relates to the role you think pre registrations or registrations have. Um, I'm more and more think they don't necessarily are valuable because of an epistemological role, but also because of a meta-scientific purpose. And I think, Evan, that that means that I would be exactly indeed in between a protocol or a, like a bare bones registration. Um, but I think that people can differ quite strongly. I mean, there are people who think that you that they mostly have an epistemological role and they mostly come into their strength, value, whatever, for like confirmatory research because it helps you to evaluate the strength of claims. Um, that's a very different perspective and would make create a very different focus on this form. They would also say, for example, that for qualitative studies, pre-registration doesn't have much added value. And I think that they're also they have that. So I think this is very much a, yeah, a function of where you fall on that spectrum, which means that we, yeah, we can go anyway with the form kind of, it's just, <laughs> Yeah, I think I can just add from a um, sort of technical or meta meta point of view, I don't know how we want to label this. This is something we're thinking a lot about at COS generally is just sort of the, the role of um, human readable versus machine readable or findable uh, objects. So thinking about, you know, um, data repositories, you know, there's many examples across different fields of data repositories that have elaborate metadata schemes that enable findability of, you know, data down to the, to the variable level. Um, in other fields, you know, these kinds of um, ontologies, systems of categorizing whatever metadata taxonomies are less developed. And we're, I'm seeing a parallel issue here that you could have these fields be designed to be sort of findable, searchable, machine readable, et cetera, versus what we have designed, which is something that's more um, just human readable and not perhaps not as future proof in terms of being able to have these other functions that some other registries do already currently have. So that's a really interesting point that I think generalizes beyond just this particular issue to sort of a bigger issue in general of being able to find and search information among these um, repositories. Um, Ricard? Yeah, I think Evan's point there about protocols is very important. And I think that part of the way how to solve this is, is I mean, because I agree uh, that this is a bit of a hybrid and it's also how, how pre-registration is used a lot in, in psychology in particular as some something in between the registration and the protocol often. But I, I think that on the landing page, what is needed is, be, is explaining that in areas where there's a tradition of writing full protocols and registering them hopefully or publishing them, that is preferable. 
uh, much in the same way it's preferable to use prospera and so on uh, and i i think this again this is like a fallback procedure for areas that do not yet have those kind of things and i also think that it's super important that this doesn't you know out compete such um such endeavors i mean if we could come to a, a stage where we have a uh, full protocol um registrations uh, like um, in registry report format for example in, in psychology systematic reviews that is of course preferable and that is of course preferable in you know law or any other field as well but we are so far away from there uh, in many areas that, but that we are yeah all right i'm going to pull out another question there's there's a, quite a few to choose from in here so i'm going to try to pick one that goes in a slightly different direction um person asks uh what was the rationale for including the option to indicate that the review is already completed when filling in the form that's also a really cool question it also relates to on how you see pre-registration or registration um if you approach this as being mostly about transparency it can still be useful for people to want to do this at a later stage um I mean, of course, if everything is done and it's published and you're not going to do anything anymore, I think, don't think it's going to be super useful. But I think for a long time, there are useful stages when it's useful to take a snapshot of your plans and your ideas at that moment. And then, I mean, in theory, you could complete this form at a few moments. You could do it like, actually, a PhD student of mine um, completed it beforehand, said in the pre-registration form that she would review her methods after she'd done like a a pilot of 100 studies and then registered again um, that allows you to see how these things change and once we have enough critical mass that can be super useful of course to improve our procedures um, so but that's my perspective and this is also i think something again like where people differ i mean not everybody thinks that registration after the pre-stage is still useful so i think it's a super super interesting question Yeah, there was another question. Uh, you brought up pilot uh, testing uh, that was related to pilots. So I think that's a useful one to bring in. Um, would it be appropriate to add a section to the form about whether and if so how a given stage of the review process would be piloted and how adjustments would be made? So I think I could imagine sort of two solutions to this. One would be adding additional fields that would address piloting. Um, and perhaps there are it's already covered under some of these fields sort of implicitly. Um, or it could be uh, using the updating function uh, within the OSF would be a nice way. So you would have a sort of versioned um, version of the <laughs> of the protocol, right? A pilot phase and then a second stage when you actually proceed to the main review. I wonder if anyone, speakers or or any others, have thoughts or reactions to that idea. Yeah, one one problem I see with um, with updating registrations all the time is that also these updates need to be reviewed. So currently, as it is, uh, the peer review system doesn't really account at all for checking pre-registration versus the, the final product. So and this because it's just extra work for the review as well. Um, and if you have like a sequence of six or eight or ten uh, secret review or rich participation, um, that might even add to the burden. So um, maybe the OSF update function can can help make the process more structured and also more easy for reviewers then to actually review the differences and the, the process. Uh, but that is, that is something we need to take into account when facilitating these. Yeah, the, the questions about the interface with peer review are really, really interesting to me, actually. Um, and it um, it's not something I've thought about in the context of this particular form. Um, I mean, I'm finding myself more and more as I'm doing peer reviews. Of course, if someone includes a registration, then I have to review the registration along with whatever else they've sent. And, you know, different reviewers differ in, in their approach to this. Um, but I wonder if we could think about how... Um, how it might be challenging to use this form in the process of review because it is so lengthy. Um, 
Like, I wonder if, um, if there are improvements we could make along that line, or if anyone has thoughts about the usefulness of forms like this within the peer review process. I mean, one thing, maybe, I don't know if we have folks from um, other backgrounds outside the social sciences on the call, but um, we don't have really a Cochrane-like body in psychology, for example. There's the Campbell, which takes some psychology-relevant work, but there is not like a sort of centralized um, organization that's doing peer review of, of basic social science um, research. And so it's one sort of hole in this space that I've often wondered about. And a, a form like this could have sort of a natural fit with, um, with that kind of peer reviewing activity. So if anyone has any um, experience with bodies like this or is from fields outside of social science, I'd be curious to hear about reviewing protocols and or registrations um, within the, the context of this field. I'll, I'll look for another question while we're, if anyone speaks up while I'm <laughs> doing that. In the meantime, while you're looking, I saw a question in the chat from Heather, if findability, that, that actually also relates to an earlier question, that whether or if findability is a main goal of the template. Um, then, then we will need categories, then we do need like ontologies and searchable stuff. I do think that this is for at least psychology, and I don't know about other fields, but for psychology, this I think will be important, but also challenging because it's quite hard even for the methods to create ontologies and standardize those. I tried with uh, Wolfgang for a while uh, to create a package. He has this ESCalc function in Meta Metaphor um, to create a package to extract basically all the conversion functions so that it would be accessible to other packages as well easily. Um, and then we also ended up with you need some kind of systematic API just for the conversion functions. And that was just already super complicated. And then the pandemic started and then the project kind of stuff. Um, but I think this is, I mean, I think we all agree that you have machine readability and human readability, and ideally you have both. But to achieve machine readability here is really, really hard, I think. So if anybody has a solution for that, that would be great. Yeah, this is where my mind is at a lot nowadays is thinking about this problem. And I feel like there's so much more that I have to learn in this area, but I, so I'm constantly looking for, for folks that know about this stuff. So if that's you, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so I have, I think it, this is actually maybe a question for Mark best suited. Um, someone is asking in what format can you download the input? So maybe you could talk a little bit about what if any API capabilities there are for registrations in OSF, Mark? Don't know if I'll be able to cover all that within six minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, essentially, the probably the best way to download the, all those inputs is going through the API. I can give you guys a link to how you can start your API. One thing about our API is that only does public registrations. It does not include any that are private or embargoed. But I'll be happy to send that document along. Um, it does much better than what I can do as a little high level. Um, but yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. We could certainly, maybe we need to follow up just, just on that topic alone. I think people, folks would find that interesting. It's the API is more powerful than we all realize. And um, it's quite interesting once you get into it. Um, all right. So we, we just have a couple minutes left. I think uh, we'll do just one more question, which is uh, when will the template go live and are further developments or adjustments planned after that? So I can speak uh, to kind of our general process, which is um, we, we're currently developing a process for templates like this to be uh, incorporated into OSF. So that process is going to be iterated through 2023. So if you are actively working in this area or other areas on related registration projects, um, you can watch out for communications uh, soon on a way to um, have those um, templates considered for consideration in OSF. So this template's already moved past that stage, right? It's been selected and it's been, now it's being piloted. 
Um, we are planning a, a phase of um, a few weeks to months somewhere in that region um, to continue to gather more feedback from the community at this piloting stage before we officially launch it. So I expect sometime within maybe early first quarter 2023 uh, or thereabouts uh, that this will be sort of uh, live and functional. In the meantime, the, the template itself is in the preprint, uh, which is linked in the agenda. And you know, folks can, of course, uh, begin using it any any time in a, in its old static form. Um, uh, it's also a, a, yes, uh, I have an R package prereger, which allows you or prereger or have you put person basically pre yeah well you prereger prereg with an R um, exactly um, but all lowercase um, because otherwise you have to type that R anyway um, and that's created to allow anybody to specify pre registration forms that are not, then not on OSF, but that you can then use in that R package to create our markdown templates um, or to fill out using the console. And this one is preloaded there as well. So if you want to use it, you can create an R markdown template that you can then render to PDF, for example, um, and yeah. then upload as a file using the OSF um, generic form. Yeah, so it could be the, an open-ended registration or, or a general, an attachment to a general registration at this point. But yeah, it will soon be available um, once we have the final version. Um, for further adjustments and developments, really any of these forms are, are open to editing um, at any time. But of course, they, um, they quickly become sort of incorporated into the broader infrastructure of OSF. So we don't um, push changes lightly. <laughs> um, but you can always email uh, Mark or anyone, uh, the OSF help as well is another good place if you have suggestions or input on, uh, for feedback on any of the templates that are up. And uh, that feedback gets reviewed and potentially then incorporated it as we push changes. Uh, so this will then be in the sort of same uh, corpus. Another thing that we're planning uh, for 2023 is reviewing the existing templates that we have and then aligning them to potentially uh, it make an incremental step towards this idea of um, making meta-scientific research and searchability, findability, and so on easier across templates. So if all uh, registration forms, for example, use the same uh, labeling and scheme for primary research question, then it becomes much easier to look across different forms for you know how that field is, is completed or filled in or what have you um so it, it it's a relatively large project but that's that's on the agenda of sort of trying to sync up the existing um forms that are already there i see evan has his hand up so go ahead please evan i'm not sure we can do this in one minute i'll send you a note okay great <laughs> does anyone else have any last thoughts or questions before we disband I really uh, appreciate all of your attending, and I, I hope you'll share this back with others in your community. And, and we hope uh, we hope this will become a really useful addition to OSF, and we're excited to share this work with all of you. Uh, so thank you, GJ and Olmo, and uh, Mark as well for joining us. And um, I hope everyone has a great day. And thank you for you and Mark for organizing this because this is I think this is super useful with all the feedback that I hope we got through the forum now as well. So thank you. And thank, thank Olmo you. for actually joining us from Berlin. Are, are you in Berlin now? Yes, you are there already, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Super cool. Going to the dinner now. <laughs> Wonderful. Nice. Yeah. Enjoy. All right. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. Bye.